Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Friday of the Gluten-Free Living Show Virtual Week for 2021. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Nicola from The Wonky Spatula, who is a keen advocate of the society and a great gluten-free cook. And I'm delighted to say that we have her for half an hour today, but I'm sure we might have a few minutes extra in case you have any questions or queries in relation to what she's cooking. So, Nicola, I've been told you're going to be cooking Christmas dinner today. How true is that? Very, very true. Now, I know it's a little bit early to be thinking about Christmas dinner, but I think like all things, Christmas comes up so, so quickly. So it's good to get the thinking out of the way and um, ahead of the big day and then you're ready to go. So I'm going to do um, kind of the trimmings today. I'm not going to attempt to cook a turkey in half an hour. Um, <laughs> I'm going to chat through my favorite kind of vegetables some gluten-free options when you're doing your gravy and your stuffing. Um, and then if we have time, I'm going to show you a little bit of um, how I kind of put the magic on my cooked ham. Lovely. So what are we going with first? First up, it's a controversial one, I'll give it to you, but I am going to show you my favorite way to cook Brussels sprouts. So for years, I kind of thought I didn't like Brussels sprouts at all, but that was because they were always boiled and they yep. only came in at Christmas. So my top tip is roasting them to get a really good, lovely flavour into them. I've got a couple here, I've half them, and I'm going to just pop a little bit of olive oil on them. Um, and I'm going to give them that extra bit of Christmas love with some lardons, so some, some crispy kind of bacon pieces. So bacon lardons. Um pretty much can be got, as far as I'm aware, in packets in most of the retail sh shops now. But if not, can you use streaky rashers cut up into cubes instead? Absolutely. And even if you can't get streaky, you can go with back bacon. Or um, if you do your ham in advance, you could take off some nice fatty pieces and pop mm. it in. You see, really at this time of the year, calorie counting and weight watching go out the window. You can have as much bacon fat as you like. Exactly. Like, you know, Christmas comes around once a year. You've got to just embrace it and enjoy it. So I've got the sprouts gone in there with some olive oil um, and the lardons. I'm just going to pop a good bit of pepper and some coarse salt. And they're going to go into the oven for about kind of 25 to 30 minutes. Um, and the, the best part of these is like, you can literally let them sit there and kind of do their own thing. They get nice and crispy. So you want to toss them halfway through, but the, the lardons, the, the kind of fat will render down um, and it's just going to be really, really gorgeous. If you want to bring them up another notch, because as you said, Christmas calories don't count, um, a little bit of maple syrup, some pine nuts and, um, walnuts, those kind of things. You can literally add anything in here. Yeah, I've had them with cranberries. Yeah, dried cranberries are gorgeous, or even sour cherries, something I discovered recently. They're delicious. So pop them into the oven at 200 degrees. Now, controversial. Have you ever done them in an air fryer? I have. So I actually got an air fryer um, a couple of weeks ago now, and anyone who follows me on Instagram will know it was a very considered purchase. I thought about it for weeks. I asked so many people, like, what the best one to get would be, and I finally bit the bullet, and they were delicious. Now, I will say, if you're a fan of boiled Brussels sprouts, you won't like them in the air fryer because they go super, super crispy, but I loved them. Yeah, I have to say, the only time I ever eat Brussels sprouts is during, at Christmas time when they're roasted. Now, what are you doing? I see you moving on to a different vegetable there now. I'm just getting my olive oil ready for the um, carrot and parsnip. So I'm a massive fan, don't get me wrong, of mashed parsnip and carrot. It's delicious. But what I find at Christmas, hob space is such a premium when it comes to, you know, you've got the gravy on, you've got the boiled potatoes, you've got everything, cauliflower, you name it. So if you can move one or two things into the oven and let that do the work, I think it's it's a good option to go for. So I have three or four parsnips here um, and the same of carrots. I've peeled and um, just kind of chopped them up into chips for the carrots themselves. For the parsnips, I leave the skin on so that you can um, really get that crispiness going into them. Yeah. And same thing again, good bit of coarse sea salt and some cracked black pepper. I know sometimes salt gets a bad rep, but 
poor sea salt that kind of naturally occurring salt and adding it to unprocessed foods you've got to do it to get a good bit of flavor into it and absolutely it, it's important to actually have salt in your diet i think there's been a couple of food fads with like fats bad salt bad like obviously everything's bad if it's not in moderation and like highly processed foods being too salty not a great thing but don't be afraid to get in with sea salt when you're cooking to get a nice bit of flavor so I've got those kind of nicely lined up on the baking tray there with the salt, the olive oil and the pepper. They're going into the oven as well. Ah, I see. And you're using one, one shelf for both, for, for both veg, which is great. Exactly. So you've got to be really, really smart at Christmas. You've got to be time efficient. You've got to be space efficient and you've got to be taste efficient. So I've also got um, some mustard and some honey ready to go. When the parsley and carrot are almost cooked, I'm going to coat them in that just to give them a lovely sweet um, and kind of, you know, a little bit different to your traditional. So just ordinary um, Dijon mustard, whole grain mustard and a little bit of honey. But we'll look at that again. Um, in about 20 minutes when it has had a bit of time to cook. Okay, Nicola, just going to jump in there very quickly, just in relation to the mustard, of course, they're gluten free and you can find the mustards that Nicola is using today, Dijon English or whole grain mustard on pages 130 in the Celiac Society food list or page 218 in the Celiac Society food list. Or if you're looking on the app, just search for mustard and it will bring it up for you. If you have any questions or queries in relation to any of the ingredients that um, Nicola is using today, please don't hesitate to contact um, ourselves here in the Celiac Society. So what are we on to next, Nicola? Potatoes. Ah, spots. Potatoes are my kryptonite and I actually exclusively only eat them at Christmas because it's just one of those things once you start on them you can't stop. So I've got some ordinary rooster potatoes. I boiled them earlier so we just um, peeled them, quartered them and put them in a little bit of water for kind of 15-20 minutes. You want to prick them with the fork as you go because like you can never be sure on exact timings for it. It just has to be a little bit firm, not too soft. I know that's a very, very one. Basically, I have then drained them off and dried them out a little bit. And um, the key with the roast potatoes is to have your fat piping, piping hot. So I have a tray in the oven that I'm going to take out now with some goose fat. You can use duck fat or um olive oil depending on you know what you're kind of going for and it's been in the oven heating the exact same time as I've been doing my potatoes so about 20-30 minutes you want to get it super 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 hot so I'm going to take it out now yeah you want to be very careful now taking this out because remember hot oil busy kitchen at Christmas the last thing you want is an accident exactly this is kind of the one time where you know Help in the kitchen, not recommended. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Getting involved. So you're going to hear a bit of a sizzle when I drop it in. Oh, lovely. Yeah. And you want to make sure that you cover the potatoes in the oil or the fat to make sure that they are going to get crispy on all the edges. I'm going to share a little tip now. Nicola and I know that I'm a bit of a foodie and I love to cook at home. Uh, what I do is when I have them parboiled, just as Nicola suggested, just they're not too soft and not too firm, is I actually sprinkle them with gluten-free plain flour and then put on my salt, my salt and pepper. And sometimes if I, depending on, on what the kind of flavors that are going, I'm going with, I might sprinkle them with um, some black pepper and salt and sea salt and um, obviously gluten-free dried ingredient uh, herbs as well uh, if I have them or I do know that there is unglued does a really good gluten-free um, spice mix which I have tried as well which is really nice on roasters so same principle you just sprinkle um, it over the spuds mix them up in the pot and then don't splash yourself Nicola uh -huh. it's okay take my uh, shoe <laughs> oh, that's fine as long as it's the shoe and not you um, and then the, just exactly as Nicola has done there coating them in the oil and putting them back in to crisp up into the oven um, really does work um, but I mean I'm my mouth is salivating here I'm sorry I didn't have lunch before we started oh it is just one of those things that, that roast potatoes are amazing and I can't wait to try the, the flour on because I'm always looking 
to elevate them to get them that little bit crispier. Oh, this really does work. And you should try the unglued um, spice mix as well. Just sprinkle it over. Do you know, it's pretty much a lot of it is uh, by touch and feel with regards to how much uh, you don't want too much flour, or too much spice and mix, but it certainly does give it a bit of a, a nice crispy edge and a, and a different flavour. How long are you putting the, the roast potatoes in, do you think, to the oven and at what temperature? 20 minutes to start off at 200 and then I'm going to give them a, a kind of a look and see how they're getting on. There's no hard and fast rule with them because so long as they don't start to burn, they'll only just get crispier and crispier. So yep. it's, kind of it's almost like the caramel of potatoes. You want it really nice and like thick golden colour. Fantastic. Sounds great. Can't wait to see what, the, what, what comes out of that. Now, what are we on to next? We are going to take a look at our gravy and um, if my hobby is. <laughs> That's all right. Well, listen, while you sort that out, I'm going to have a quick chat with you about, um, um, you have written a cookbook, Nicola. Tell us a bit more about the, the Wonky Spatula cookbook and where is it available? Um, the Wonky Spatula cookbook, it's all about like healthy food, but healthy food for life. So I never like to hear of people, you know, going on diets, especially in the run-up to Christmas and food. I always find that you should make kind of sustainable, healthy choices as you go along. So, you know, cutting back maybe on things or adding things into your diet rather than eliminating things completely are just kind of you want to be looking at the way you're eating and say yeah I can do this for the rest of my life not I'll do this for six weeks I'll go on that holiday and then all will be well and um, so it kind of came from a place of wanting to show people that healthy food doesn't have to be boring and um, there is a hundred and twelve recipes in the book and wow great so yeah, um, there's, there's everything from uh, quick and easy breakfasts to um, showstopper cakes. So a bit of everything in there. Um, so and is it where is it available? Can we get it? Where can, it, can, can people buy it? Yeah, so it's available in all good bookstores and um, online. You can actually get a discount code through the CDF Society. Um, so there is a page on the website that, that showcases that. Um, and it's on Eastern Sun Book Depository, all those good places as well. Okay. Um, streaky rashers are um, gluten-free. It's a meat. So, you know, it is gluten-free. Yeah. Super. What I'm going to do is my super cool um, hob is not playing ball. So I'm going to put the gravy onto my actual hob. But what Brand. I want to do is how I do it. So I have got some chicken stock in there, about 300 ml. So you can use um, bouillon, you can use stock pots, whatever you have, but just make sure that you're checking those ingredients and making sure that it is gluten free and um, it's not all of them are. I've got then a little bit of meat juices. We're going to pretend it's Christmas day. I've drained off the turkey. I've taken off the layer of fat and I've got the, um, the juices in there. So one thing actually about Christmas time is sometimes it, you may not have made gravy in absolute ages and you kind of forget that when you take it off there is that level of fat and a lot of people have those really cool gadgets you know that suck out the fat and whatever I actually don't believe them at all just get a couple of ice cubes lash them in and the fat sticks to the ice cube so it's a really really what a cool tip yeah and um, to be honest you could be all day trying to work out how to work those little fat sucker things. So when an ice cube will do just as well. Fair play. Didn't real didn't know that actually. So that's a nice tip to have. Now what are you putting in there? And um, I actually was gonna hold that for a second, then put it in, but it has decided to go in already. It's a tablespoon of tomato puree, just to give our gravy a nice rich colour and an extra bit of flavour. And then the last little ingredient is some arrowroot powder. So I use this as my thickener for all of my kind of gluten-free cooking. It's largely available in most supermarkets um, and it's available online through like health food shops and that kind of thing. What I love about it is you can just kind of lash it into things hot or cold. You don't have to worry about clumps or, you know, making a paste with it. Oh, um, that's handy because, you know, I use gluten-free flour to make a roux um, and that can be time consuming and uh, lumpy. So arrowroot is good to know. Yeah, no, definitely. So it all kind of comes together here now. It, I will kind of, you won't get that thick, dark gravy color, but the puree um, will give you kind of a little bit of a darker color. So you want to just pop it onto your top, bring it to the boil and let it simmer for kind of five to 10 minutes until it's nice and thick. So I'll pop mine over to the side so you can kind of get a feel of it. Um, okay. 
And as it's, if it's too thick, Nicola, can you take it down with water? Yes, absolutely. Or you can take it down with a little bit more stock if you want to make sure that you're kind of keeping the flavour in there. But water is no problem either. Just make sure that you're kind of tasting it so that the seasoning doesn't kind of go out the window um, and, it, and it goes watery on you. Great. Um, there is a question here in relation to how much of honey and mustard. Now, Nicola's recipes will be available again after um, the demonstration. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was, let me get this right now for the honey and mustard. It was three tablespoons of honey, one tablespoon of English or Dijon mustard and two tablespoons of whole grain mustard. And as I mentioned, the mustards, you can find them on page 130 or page 218 of the gluten-free um, society, the, the gluten-free uh, book, the, the Celiac Society's food list. Or if you just Google or not Google, sorry, search in the app for mustard, it'll come up. Sorry, Nicola. No, no, all good. And with any of the recipes, because you know, everyone's catering to different family sizes over Christmas. You can scale them up or scale them down. With the vegetables, it's very much all about eyeballing. Same with the, um, the stuffing. The only thing that I will ever kind of religiously measure at Christmas time is what I'm putting in my cranberry sauce because I've gotten given out to for putting too much pork in and then the next year too little. <laughs> and then... Um, the gravy. You just need to be careful with liquid recipes to make sure that, you know, you keep the balance right. But if you're kind of doing your parsnips and carrots and when you go to toss them up, because the thing is as well, parsnips vary in sizes. So one person's like three could be twice the size of somebody else's. So just eyeball it. And if you need a little bit more, put a bit more in. Or if you're kind of pouring it in and you're like, oh, it's quite liquidy, just hold a bit back. Yeah. Okay. What are we on to next? We are on to the stuffing. So I know breadcrumbs with gluten-free bread can be a little bit of, like, let's be honest, a bit of a nightmare sometimes because it can get a little bit clumpy or you don't get the right consistency. So I've spent quite a lot of time testing different breadcrumbs um, and I'm using at the moment the promise gluten-free and um, it should be one of the items on the list. It is. Um, what I've done is I actually leave the bag open for like a day or two just because you kind of you need stale bread for, yep. um, for stuffing and like the sauce quite low that I'm using is absolutely delicious and um, so what you do is you just leave it open for a day or two before Christmas you're, you're talking you know half an inch of the bag just to get a bit of air into it um, and then pop it into the food processor to get the crumbs and to be honest like I would kind of challenge anybody to tell me the difference between, you know, shop-bought ordinary crumbs. No, they're excellent. They look really good. They're not even stuck together. They're like free-flowing and fluffy. Yeah. They fun could call a breadcrumb fluffy. <laughs> and one thing that you can do, because like, I love to get ahead of the game when it comes to Christmas, so I'll do the spuds, like, for Christmas Day, Stephen's Day, and the day after on Christmas Eve, and I'll leave them out in the side passage in a big thing of water so that you're only kind of doing that once. For anyone who gets their nails done at Christmas, it's a great way to make sure that you preserve them. Priorities. I like your thinking. Exactly. And, and the thing with the breadcrumbs as well, like, there's absolutely nothing to stop you testing them out in the next couple of weeks and then putting them in the freezer. Yes. Um, so put them in a freezer, Ziploc bag, and then just take them out the morning of and by, you know, 11 a.m. or so, depending on how early you get up now, <laughs> they, they will be ready to go. So a little bit of time savers in the run-up is, is really, really good. Um, so the, the recipe for the stuffing outside of, you know, making sure that you've got gluten-free bread, it's fairly, fairly standard. So I've got a good hunk of butter. Again, it's Christmas, just, you know, full fat, full frontal of butter going in. Um, 150 grams here and then I have one half of a large kind of Spanish onion um, and you can do this over a hob or what I'm going to do because again I'm all about the hob space at Christmas I'm just going to pop it in the microwave for yeah. a couple of minutes just a little bit of cling film there always make sure when you're putting things with cling film in the microwave need a little air vent so pop it in and um, try not to do it right in the middle of the butter <laughs> <laughs> so yeah 
the breadcrumbs, um, Nicola is suggesting that you do them beforehand and that you can keep them then in a freezer bag. That's not the stuffing. So it's just that the raw breadcrumbs can be frozen in the freezer. Um, I hate, sorry if that's being pedantic about it for some people, but um, ideally it would be the raw breadcrumbs that you would keep in the freezer, not the raw stuffing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because like you can freeze things you know, as they are in a certain form, absolutely no problem. But yeah, things like stuffing, it's not a, it's not a good vibe. Um, so I've got the breadcrumbs in there and then I have a good bit of parsley and thyme. And that's fresh parsley and thyme you're using, Nicola, is it? Parsley and thyme, yes. So to give you kind of an idea of how much I use, um, this little lad was full this morning. So it's a good bit of parsley. Yeah. Uh, and similarly with the time but this is one thing as well that you can do in advance you could do your herbs on Christmas Eve like you know the night before half yeah. a month ago um, and what you want to make sure with them is it's the only time that you need to be really really kind of almost pedantic in slicing it really really finely so that you know you don't get big lumps when you go to to make the stuffing and um, you could absolutely again I'm a big fan of freezer these can actually be frozen as well. Herbs freeze very, very well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it's something that um, we are trying to encourage our members to look at is that you can prepare fresh herbs and freeze them because it's so hard to ensure that the dried herbs are gluten free and safe from and safe from cross contamination. So um, unless you have seen herbs in our food list or on our app, um, which you know have been certified or endorsed by the Celiac Society, I would recommend the frozen or the fresh uh, herb prep and, fro and then freezing them afterwards. Um, again, some of the uh, herbs can, are only available online. I think Hambledon being one of them that mentioned in our food list. And again, if you're not sure, just drop us an email to info at celiac.ie. Oh my goodness, that looks so good already. That was so quick. So it, it's really, really quick when you do it in the microwave. And the onion gets that lovely kind of nice translucent colour very, very quickly because it basically confies in the fat of the butter. Yeah. So really uh, nice. Now, of course, the other thing is mind your hands taking that off because it's hot. Yes, definitely. That's where now I do have to say being a girl with long nails can come in handy because you can get in under. But <laughs> be careful. This again is another task. Like the bowl will be quite hot, so it's not one to get the kids involved in. Same with the, the potatoes, but other things like chopping up the vegetables, making the mix for the parsimon carrot like that's great fun for kids and I kind of feel especially if they've been recently diagnosed and they're kind of feeling that there's a lot of rules around kind of food and what they can and what they can't have getting them into the kitchen and getting them involved as part of the process will be really really good for them. I agree. That's a fantastic um, suggestion. Um, I just see uh, while you're doing that, um, the oven, is it the 200 Celsius? Is that for a fan oven? Um, I have a question from Eileen or is it just an ordinary oven? Ordinary oven. So if you were doing fan, it would be um, between 180 and 190. So always subtract kind of like 10 right. for the, the fan oven. And um, one thing I will say when you're doing the turkey, if you have a fan oven, absolutely do the fan because it circulates the air really, really well, which is important, making sure that you've got a, a fully cooked bird. Everybody loves a fully cooked bird. <laughs> um, I have another question in from Enid. Uh, where can you get gluten-free lardons? Enid, I've actually seen them in packets in some of the bigger retail uh, supermarkets. And like the alternative then is that you just cut up your streaky rashers into either strips or cubes. So yeah, very easily got. And gluten-free lardons, lardons are naturally gluten-free because meats are naturally gluten-free. It's only if meats have a coating or breadcrumbs that you'd have to check whether or not they're actually on our food list or not. So think about it. It's raw. It's raw meat. Gluten-free lardons are, are lardons are raw meat. There's just basically ra rashers by another name. So I've just put a little bit of salt and pepper in there. And one thing that I like to do with my stuffing is add a little bit of lemon juice. So it helps with the binding, and that little bit of kind of acidity as well pops another kind of layer to the flavour. Um, Sounds yummy. Like I kind of would challenge anyone to. Say that it's any different to, to normal stuffing in terms of the consistency it's really really all there and um, now you can make these into if you want to keep your gluten-free stuffing from from everything else 
I'd recommend making them into little balls and putting them separately in the oven and um, in an oven proof dish. Or if you're not fussed about that kind of thing, because sometimes the balls can fall apart because of how much butter you have in them. Because if you're like me, you put that extra bit in. You can just do them flat in a dish and then scoop it out like ordinary stuffing um, when you go to serve. I have a suggestion. I wonder what you think about this. I get at Christmas time um, gluten free sausage meat. Uh, and I do that either by taking the sausage meat out of gluten free sausages and then putting it into my gluten free stuffing and making gluten free sausage meat stuffing. And you see, you can roll that then, you can make it into like a log and then you can cook it in tin foil in the oven. And um, it's a little bit different, I have to say. I really like it. Um, and I just wondered what you thought about that. Absolutely amazing. There is just something so good about sausage stuffing. And if you do have any of the sausage meat left over, you can make little patties for <gasps> So whoever is on kind of turkey duty needs to be briefed to keep a little bit fat and um, kind of pat them down into a little patty, a little bit of gluten-free uh, flour either side and into the pan you will never eat a normal sausage again. <laughs> oh, wow. I definitely have to try that for sure. So that's the stuffing. And you're going to put that, uh, you put that into the oven, either, like you say, either in a dish that you can cover or you can make it into little balls um, or you could put it into, um, you could make your own sort of, I suppose, um, uh, tin foil casing for it. I like a tin foil parcel and put it into that. Yeah, absolutely. And like that stuffing can be used any time of the year. Like if you want to do pork chops with the stuffing on top. I know it's a very 80s thing, but I absolutely love it. Or um, take a pork steak and fill it with stuffing and do it that way as well. Yeah, exactly. So it's one of those recipes that no matter the time of the year, it can be used. So I just wanted to quickly show you the gravy. It's gotten nice and thick. Oh, wow. That looks great. Yeah, so like it really is. Um, with the air root in there, it's really, really perfect. Um, and as we said, a little bit of gluten free flour if you can't get the, the arrow root, um, that's no problem at all. So let's just have a quick look. We've got two minutes left. How are we doing for time? We're doing grand. We're at 13. We're just two minutes to a quarter to two. Um, and if you are happy to stay on, I know the rest of the, the members here will be happy to stay on as well. While you're just preparing the ham, very quickly, um, Deirdre has asked, where would I get gluten-free sausage meat, please? Now, Deirdre, what I have done is I have bought gluten-free sausages, which are available in most of the major supermarkets, split the sausage and uh, or pushed the, the sausage meat out of that. I think you can also, you may be able to get it in in um, Super Value, um, you may be able to get it in Dunn's uh, or you may be able to get it in Tesco's. I'm not 100% sure about Aldi or Lidl, just to make sure I've mentioned every major retailer in the country. Um, so, but I, if you have any questions, uh, come back to us at info at celiac.ie. Hambledon herbs, as far as I'm aware, Eileen, are not available off the shelf in Ireland. We are trying to get them in for our new pop-up shop here in Clondalkin in West Dublin, but I'm almost certain you can get them online. Again, Eileen, to get clarified, Clarification on that, please send me and send us an email at info at celiac.ie. And Deirdre, you're welcome. Um, right, what are we on to now? The ham. So, the ham, um, you'll see in the recipe notes, my life changed when I started baking my ham at Christmas. So, it's absolutely like the best thing ever. You steep it as normal for an hour to two hours, depending on how salty you like your ham. Um, and then I put it into the oven. Um, in a, what I call a tinfoil tent. So you've got it wrapped over this way and then wrapped over the other way again, just to make sure that you're definitely not getting any air out of it. So the instructions that I go by are in there. So it's um, by weight um, and then always 30 minutes over just to be safe um, and ready. Also what I do is I have a little bit of a meat thermometer that I use to make sure that my ham is fully cooked. And um, so it's kind of kind of 54, um, is it 54? 60 degrees inserted into the middle is what you want to aim for for it to be fully cooked. So, so Nicola, just to be, you don't boil the ham first? No. Ah, interesting. Yeah. So we, we, we tried and tested it over the years. We used to do just boiled. Then I got to a stage where 
I got the committee of Christmas, my whole family, uh, to agree to putting it in the oven afterwards to see how that went. And then we're at a stage where it's fully, fully baked. So you take it out of the oven. Now this has been cooling down while we've been chatting. So I am okay to touch it, but it's been out of the oven just to be fully transparent for about 45 minutes. Okay. So what I want to do is take off this hard layer of fat, keeping back as much of the fat as possible because you're just removing kind of the skin. Yeah, so the rind, so to speak. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and then what I do is I crisscross the top and put some maple syrup on it. Um, and you just kind of do it in the grill then, get it nice and crispy. And if your ham is fully cooked, it should the rind kind of should come off pretty easily. And um, if you're having trouble with it, I would say it needs to go back into the oven. I'm barely kind of grazing the knife on it. Yeah, I can see that. And that's actually very clear in the film there now. So again, I just see it's just practically falling off once you're pulling at it, which is great, which means you do get that nice bit of fat. Exactly. And sometimes at the moment, I think, it can be hard to get a ham with a good bit of fat on it so don't be afraid to it is there's something about you know eu law and legislation about the fact that you can't have a certain amount of fat depth on a bit of ham so it's like you can't get pork crackling very much anymore either which is an awful pity it's like we've been censored exactly <laughs> i agree i agree um so i have all the the rind all fat now and what i'm going to do is i'm slicing quite deeply into it um across so you should begin to see kind of the fat separating as I do it. Yep. Lovely little marks going on all the way. So practically going through the fat right to the meat. Exactly. Because you want to get it like down so that it separates. What you want to be able to do is make sure that the maple syrup gets into the meat. Yeah. And while you're doing that as well, you'll know if you missed any of the rind. I missed a little bit there and it's kind of quite visible if you don't. Do. and then the maple syrup so there's I'm going to say half a jar is what you need at Christmas but it really does depend on your hand and you just literally pour it over and get yourself a pastry um brush and give it a I give you a funny story my my mum was a great baker at home as well and she needed a new pastry brush so she sent my dad when he was going out to buy going into the local town to buy and said, get me a pastry brush if you can. He came back with um, an inch, a quarter, an inch um, paintbrush. He said he couldn't find her a pastry brush, but that maybe this would do instead. So she sterilized it and it's the best pastry brush she's used in years. I'd say so because like you need good bristles. That's why I go for the plasticky ones because otherwise the bristles come out and- Exactly. So um, what you want to do as well is give the side of the ham a little bit of a glaze with it as well. Um, and then I put it back into the oven on the grill setting to get a nice crispy piece going in. Great. Um, so we are going to just have a quick look now to finish up at our vegetables. Oh yeah. So let me just get another glove so I can angle it up for you guys. The Brussels sprouts. Oh, yummy! Yeah. So I'd probably give them another toss now and put them back in just while I'm getting everything else ready. I'm I'm hearing I'm hearing mmms from behind me in the office, guys. I mean, that's how good these are. And then the parsnip and carrot are looking good and sizzly. So what we want to do there is just pour over the, the glaze, uh, the glaze, and then just give them a little bit of, of a toss. Uh, yeah. So just to remind everybody, that's three tablespoons of honey, a tablespoon of Dijon or English mustard and two tablespoons of whole grain mustard. And again, those uh, mustards are available in the food list on page 130 and page 218. Or if you search for mustard in the Minding Me gluten-free app, which is available on all good app stores for both Apple and Android. Or you can look it up on celiac.ie forward slash app app. Uh, Jerry has said he's been cooking, or Jerry, I'm assuming it's a, a, a he, I am sorry if, if I'm wrong. Uh, they have been cooking Christmas dinner for 40 years or more, and they always put the stuffing into the turkey. Well, fair play to you, because you're right. The stuffing does stay moist, and it adds a good bit of flavour from the turkey to the stuffing, but also vice versa, the stuffing to the, tur or to the turkey. Yeah, no, definitely. And I suppose it's just a case of if 
the whole family is going gluten free and they're happy to do that, then it goes in. Um, but if it's a case of, you know, there are certain guests who are CDAP and certain guests who aren't, then I wouldn't recommend stuffing it because you just don't want to risk it at, at Christmas time. I think we should be a benevolent dictator and insist everybody have the gluten-free stuffing. It looks so good. That's for sure. Well, I mean, it's always down to the cook. So I agree. Definitely. Rules. And like, you can put certain things to the committee, but like, come on. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'm just going to show you where the potatoes are at. I don't anticipate that they will be fully done yet because I like to leave them for a bit longer. But just so you can kind of see how crispy they could potentially get because like if you're looking at them and um, at this stage and you're kind of thinking oh maybe they won't get any crispier i would say put them back in so yeah bring them so you can get a few and then i'll bring them up to the camera and um, also it's absolutely imperative at this stage that you play felice navidad <laughs> <laughs> Yep, they're getting there. But they're not quite done. Like the, the longer the better with these. So Nicola, um, turkey uh, is always a tricky one to get right. Um, and I know obviously given the time constraints we had here today, it's not something that we could actually show um, our members. But what do you do in relation to the turkey? When do you put it on? How long do you give it? That kind of thing. What tips can you give our, our, our viewers here today? So my, my top thing with the turkey is that it has to be out of the fridge for a couple of hours before you put it in the oven. So it's got to have time to get up to room temperature because otherwise you're going to shock it and um, putting it putting it into the oven. And um, one of the key things that I think um, when it comes to getting a moist turkey is there is no such thing as enough butter. Um, so what I do is I actually lift up the skin between the breast yeah and put the butter in in pockets and spend a good bit of time kind of massaging it down making sure it's in the legs absolutely everywhere so you want a good layer of butter and um, but you don't want big pockets of it you really need to spread it out and then more butter on top as well and um, what i like to do is i'll cover the whole turkey for a certain amount of time um, and then i will open it up to let everything get cooked sometimes i'll leave the legs covered as well if I'm feeling that the legs are golden enough but the the breast piece isn't quite there yet like don't be afraid to cover certain parts of it during yeah um, and I think the the most kind of important is just making sure that you absolutely have it cooked so the juices are running clear it's up to temperature and um, and then when you sit down um to kind of maybe have your starters or your drinks beforehand or whatever the turkey should be out of the oven. So I leave my turkey out of the oven for about 45, 50 minutes before we eat. Now, you might think, oh God, we'll be gone stone cold. It absolutely won't. Um, cover it with tin foil, a couple of um, tea cloths on top yep. of it, insulate it. Um, and it will be just such a joy to slice because the juices will have kind of gone back into the turkey. If you cut it straight away, it, it's again, it's a bit like putting it into the fridge and, and into the oven straight away. It'll shock the meat. So the meat needs time to rest after it's done. Um, so that's one of the, the main things for me. Um, okay. And have you ever soaked the turkey overnight in anything? I myself have done it in um, bra uh, brine and done it with um, parsley, thyme, uh, lemon and lemons and oranges and a cinnamon stick and that has actually turned out really nice it made it very moist now I did do what you suggested as well which is I put a bit of butter not as much butter but a little bit of butter under the skin as well um and it it, it really kept it very much that's the one thing about turkey it can be very dry yeah that's that's definitely it and like I think frying is is a great way to, to make sure that you get the liquid into it same with the the butter and also like don't rush the cooking process as well. Yeah. You know, like kind of lower kind of temperature to start off, sorry, hot temperature to start off with, kick it, turn it right down and let it do its thing because it is, you know, you've got to treat the turkey right at Christmas is, is the main thing. It's not something you can rush. Um, and if it means, you know, pushing dinner out by 40, 45 minutes, have a game of Scrabble, you know, <laughs> have a yeah. practice 
don't kind of rush into it because like it, it should just get its day. Great stuff. Listen, Nicola, we've had great fun here this afternoon watching uh, Christmas dinner in November. I really did enjoy it. And um, just to remind people again that your book is available through the Society with a discount code if you're looking for a very good Christmas gift this year. Nicola's uh, cookbook is something you can't go wrong with. Um, if you have any more questions or queries in relation to the recipes, they will be made available to all our attendees after uh, the session here this afternoon. Um, and I do see that somebody has asked just very quickly I'm going to try and get through some of these very quickly and um, the pop-up shop is open we are on 78 to 80 Tower Road in Clondalkin and the opening hours are 10 to 4 Monday to Friday please do pop in we have some fantastic Christmas produce including Christmas cake slices Christmas cake uh chocolate biscuit cake and I believe mince pies oh and of course if you want to make your own mince pies we have some really good gluten-free mince meat for people as well Nicola do, do do call in if you're in our neck of the woods we'd be delighted to see you and thank you again for your time this afternoon thanks Amelia and I hope everyone has a fab Christmas cheers happy Christmas to you too I can't believe I'm saying it's so early in the month have a great Feliz one Nicola Navidad. take care Feliz Navidad